Um, so, <laughs> so I'm Marissa Parham. I am a professor of English here at Amherst College. I'm also the director of Five College Digital Humanities. Um, we have today our next speaker in our Five College DH speaker series, which is an ongoing year-long series which looks at the question of simply what's at stake in thinking about the digital alongside humanistic concerns. Fox Harrell, PhD, is here today. Um, he is an associate professor of digital media in the Comparative Media Studies program and a computer science and artificial intelligence laboratory at MIT. He founded and directs the MIT Imagination Computation Expression Laboratory. His work explores the relationship between imaginative cognition and computation, and his research involves developing new forms of computational narrative, gaming, social media, and related digital media based in computer science, cognitive science, and digital media arts. He aims to push the boundaries of how computers can be used for creative expression and social empowerment. He holds a PhD in computer science and cognitive science from the University of California, San Diego. We were having a really interesting conversation, I think, earlier today of really thinking about what it means to transmit to people the notion that if you have interests in computation or in the quote hard sciences, those interests don't actually have to be separate from humanistic inquiries. That it's reasonable to want to think about these things at the same time. But I think a lot of this work and your work in particular helps us think about what it means to imagine a pathway to carrying all the things we care about through various kinds of methods that draw from the sciences but also speak in a more large way, or in a larger way, sorry, to the humanities. So we'll be beginning today with our talk from our guest, and then after that we'll be able to open up for questions from the audience. Please join me in welcoming. Well, th thanks, Marissa, so much for the very gracious introduction. It's, not, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Yeah, so it's one of the places I've been where you know, the constant uh, comments and questions and engagement has been really profound from uh, undergrads, uh, post-baccalaureate uh, researchers here, and, and, and faculty alike. So it's really just been such a pleasure. And I think that Professor Parham is also one of the people that's bridging these different kind of concerns, bringing uh, engineering and computing together with humanistic inquiry, and questions really about human power relationships and configurations. So. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Yeah, so, uh, this, yeah, so I'll be talking today about digital selves in phantasmal media. So I'll tell you a little bit about what I mean by this idea of phantasmal media. And this is the structure for the talk. Yeah, so I'll just introduce my ideas uh, uh, briefly before talking about some of the enabling insights to help in doing this bridging work between disciplines. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about particular phantasms of, of computational identity because my work spans from interactive narrative, social media, and, and gaming, and, and new ways to say create games or media where you change theme or metaphor or a cultural perspective each time you run it using AI, but also recently work dealing with issues of identity. So that includes uh, uh, not, not only normative forms of identity like uh, gender, race, ethnicity, and so forth, but also body language, uh, fashion, self-presentation in everyday life, uh, and, and more. Uh, and so uh, the work has moved into this area of identity. I'll talk about a few systems that we've built to add more nuance to the ways that computing can be used to analyze and model and express identity before a brief conclusion. And so to introduce things, so I founded and direct, uh, as uh, Marissa said, the Imagination, Computation, and Expression Lab at, at MIT. We do work in creative expression, cultural analysis, and social empowerment using computing. And so uh, again, we've built a number of different systems, ranging from interactive narratives to games and social media and so forth. Uh, and we're really looking at the way that uh, cultural values are built into computing systems. Yeah, and so that's the kind of topic of, the, of my book, Phantasmal Media, you know, to look at the way that, uh, that subjectivity, culture, criticality uh, can be expressed and understood through algorithms and data structures, which is usually seen as this objective, you know, technical other, si uh, other side from, from the kind of core human issues. And uh, recently, I began, uh, began asking questions uh, such as, uh, well, how are issues of social identity, such as, say, race and gender, implemented across platforms? What about issues of social status, stigma, stereotyping, and discrimination, other forms of power relationships? How, do, how are those uh, implemented in computational systems? And how are they transformed in new ways at the technical and social level? 
Now, so let me begin with just uh, uh, an uh, example of the kind of things someone might study in, say, sociology or the humanities. Right? So we know that there are a number of kind of stereotypes that exist that are out there uh, in the world. And uh, sociologists might study, for example, the way that we change our self-presentation for different settings. You might dress a different way on the job compared to how you do with your family or friends. Yeah, so these are topics that have been long studied in, the, in these areas. So uh, double consciousness, the idea of W.E.B. Du Bois, the difference between how society sees you and how you see uh, yourself, uh, as we see uh, here. <laughs> right, so, yeah, so this is a topic that, that's uh, venerable within sociology. Irving Goffman has long studied how we manage impressions that others have of us as a way to, uh, to handle stigma in society. But I think that uh, the work of Goffman and Du Bois uh, might uh, raise questions when you begin to apply them to uh, the digital realm. You know, so how do you translate these ideas to social media or, or to games? Yeah, so we have a famous cartoon that was uh, 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 critiqued by Lisa Nakamura in, in her work on race and games here. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Right? So right, this, is, this is a kind of utopian vision, right? the idea that you're leaving your identity behind. But what does that really mean? It means that uh, well, who do they imagine you to be? You know, Lisa, Lisa argues. You know, so uh, you know, that's the idea that, you know, well, maybe if you're imagined to be part of a privileged uh, category, then that's fine. But what if you want to carry your cultural identity in, into those spaces? Uh, th then it might, in fact, matter who you are uh, offline. And also, people bring their biases from the real world in, into the social world. And on the other side, there's a, there's a system called uh, uh, Becoming Dragon, which was done by, a, by an artist who identifies as a transgender artist named Micra Cardenas, working on her PhD at U University of Southern California now. And so this was a, this was a 365 hour virtual reality performance in which uh, uh, she performed as a dragon in Second Life uh, using a, he a head mounted display uh, as a kind of metaphor for the, uh, the, the experience of uh, dressing as uh, uh, the, the gender being transitioned to. Uh, and, uh, and, and so this was a kind of uh, uh, endurance performance, uh, but, but Micah encountered all new forms of discrimination online as a dragon. So going into a cyberpunk zone and people saying, what are you doing here as a, as a dragon and so forth. And so it was really thinking about some of these kind of new issues. Right, so, th so there is a generation of scholars that's begun to think about, uh, about how some of these issues from the real world persist in the virtual. But I think there are also important new questions that, that have emerged that are as of yet uh, uh, underexplored and, and need to be pioneered. So I think that these questions involve how do actual data structures, how do actual algorithms implement both long existing and newly emergent uh, phenomena of identity? And so what do I mean by newly emergent phenomena of identity? Well, here, here's one example. Yeah, so this is, this is a, a data scraping. Uh, uh, algorithm that somebody wrote to collect information about people on Facebook and puts them into categories that they didn't assign, assign themselves to that probably they don't want to be in. So uh, uh, who's taking drugs, who wants to get fired, and, and, and so forth. Right? So it's just doing text analysis and then putting users unwittingly into these kind of categories. Yeah, so this kind of categorization using back-end uh, data uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, taking, uh, and taking data to, put, to categorize you in ways that are unexpected is a kind of new phenomenon that's also happening behind the scenes, say, when you use recommender systems. Uh, was there a clarifying question? Uh, okay. All right, and so here, here's, a, here's another example. And so in Second Life, you know, so what we have here uh, uh, on uh, your right side is a kind of default uh, character with uh, uh, a brown skin here, but somebody actually wrote a new light reflectance model, so a new shader. And actually, I think you can see that the image is much more luminous, right? So, and so it just means that the default uh, uh, graphical model, you know, the default render, is not optimized for the skin tone that you see on, on uh, the image on your right. And so there actually had to be a technical in in intervention. If somebody actually had to program a new light reflectance model in, in order to make uh, you know, what they saw as a more equitable or empowering representation. And so then that's again something where the work is at the technical level, at the data structural and algorithmic level where the intervention has to be made. And so the kind of work that I'm doing uh, under the rubric of, uh, of cultural computing is work that enables us to understand cultural phenomena at the code level. And uh, I also build computational models and systems to help analyze and uh, simulate or model identity phenomena such as these. So you could think of this kind of work as building a bridge between cultural meanings, you know, so all the things I've spoken to you about, 
identity phenomena such as double consciousness, impression management, stereotyping, stigma, power relationships, and the computational side in computational media, in algorithms, data structures, in software such as social networking profiles, uh, uh, e-commerce accounts, avatars, characters, etc. Yeah, so that's just to give you a sense of the kind of uh, gap that this work is trying to bridge. A and so there are a couple of insights that helped in, in forming the bridge uh, th th that allowed these areas to be put together. A and so just to spark the discussion of this, I have uh, uh, one question for you, which is, uh, uh, and this, this is to help encourage and give you intuition for the definition of phantasm. So uh, what does this sign mean? Right, right. Yeah, so as people g gave answers such as uh, ladies, female, yeah, in case you didn't hear what other people are saying. And so, uh, yeah, so, and so you know, you know, that's, those are fair enough. You know, I don't think you had to do much deliberation to, you know, in order to come up with that, that answer. You're very familiar with it. But, but in fact, of course, uh, as anyone who's studied uh, semiotics uh, knows, that in order to make that, uh, in order to make that attribution, you have to, you're drawing upon some shared cultural knowledge, right? So that's uh, uh, you know, belief and knowledge about the world uh, and recruiting information from that, you know, some particular concept, and then uh, mapping that on to the particular image that's at hand. Uh, and that image you immediately apprehend as having, as having a particular meaning. And the interesting thing here is that nobody said that, well, this is somebody wearing a cape right, in silhouette, this is somebody wearing a kilt, you could have interpreted it that way just as easily, uh, right? And even people who do not feel that, uh, as, as uh, you yourself said, ladies or females should or do dress in that way, it's still without much uh, trouble or deliberation, you still immediately understood that, that, that meaning. And so that's just to give you a little bit of an idea, you know, we'll keep on going to think about what I mean by phantasm. And so to go further, well, this is another image that means the exact same thing that happens to be used in hospital systems in India and that was designed at the Indian Institute of Technology. This is another image that means the same thing that's used in Oman, right? And so these, these are different cultural representations. And I think when you begin to integrate knowledge from different cultural representations, the phantasm begins to be revealed. You know, the assumptions that you had regarding the first image, I in fact, are exposed because we see that there are multiple Im interpretations of that, uh, uh, of that image. Right, and so you begin to see that there are assumptions about what women wear that are built into, the, into that. And so that's a little bit about what I mean by, by phantasm. So in the book Phantasmal Media, you know, I go much more in depth about the cognitive science underpinnings of these ideas. Right now I just want to give you a, a kind of intuition for what I'm talking about. And there, there's a more technical nomenclature, but the point is that these phantasms operate within, within systems and we immediately understand their meaning based upon recruiting from a worldview and, and taking that worldview and understanding it through particular media, media forms. And, and here's ano another kind of rhetorical question towards helping to understand phant phantasms. So if you were to, if I were to ask you which of these shapes has greater area, then how, how would you compute or how would you figure out the answer? Uh, yes? Right, that's, that's a great way to do it. You know, so usually I get two types of answers. You know, so one is the overlapping answer. You know, the other one is an elementary algebra equation to contrast the area between the two. And of course you could get the answer either way, right? But, uh, but there's something particular about when you take your approach here, which is uh, if I were to ask you, you know, how do you tell which has greater area or even which has greater area, you wouldn't have to think about it with this, with this version. You would just instantly say, uh, well, I just look at them. That's how I would tell the answer. And the circle obviously has greater area. And so the point is that, we're a, 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 that it's a distributed cognition process, you know, that, as cognitive scientists would call it. We're offloading part of our thinking onto the image. You know, so that means that uh, we don't have to think about this consciously because the information is encoded in the image itself. Uh, right, that's what Ed Hutchins calls a material anchor. You know, it's some kind of visual image that helps you to, in, in your thought process so you don't have to consciously compute something. And so my contention is with phantasms, the same sort of process, this process is happening but with social issues. So when you see this kind of image, you're also offloading part of your cognition onto it, but in this case, it's issues of worldview. You know, we're understanding socially what this kind of image means immediately in the same way that we were able to compute area with the, with the superimposed images. And of course, the same holds true with this image, right? You know, we're, we're using the same kind of phenomenon to understand it, and the same holds true for this image that's more elaborate, but the same kind of concept or this image. 
uh, and so each of these are encoding certain kind of phantasms that include cultural knowledge that, that might be stereotypical in, uh, in this Final Fantasy game. Actually, actually this uh, 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 chocobo chick lives in his, in, in, in his afro. Yeah? So yeah, there are a number of kind of stereotypes that, that are built into, uh, into the system, right? And so you might ask what happens then when people begin to play through these games that, that have these phantasms that are just built into their structure about, about identity. And actually, that's nothing new. That's nothing new to investigate. So people might recognize this image. Right? So this is a classic study by Kenneth and Mamie Clark uh, of, uh, uh, of African-American children studying, uh, uh, you know, choosing between you know, black and white baby dolls. And so invariably, uh, you know, the majority of the children, uh, well, you can see which one the, the child is, uh, is, is choosing here. Uh, and, uh, and so the idea is that there are aspects of worldview that are built in, into these systems right, the, the, without deliberating when asked which doll is like you, which doll is a good doll, which doll looks nice, and the kids choose this one doll, of course, so they're, they're also doing this based on, on a kind of phantasm. Uh, but the point here is not just uh, uh, that the phantasm exists, but I want to, in the book, explore how can we analyze these phantasms in a way that's useful for computing systems in particular. And so in computing systems, data is very structured. Yeah, so one of the things we begin to do is to begin thinking about describing phantasms in a formal or semi-formal way. Uh, and so that doesn't mean that this is exactly the way that human brains operate, but when you begin to look at systems and you have data structures behind characters, uh, then you might say that the worldview the kid is drawing from can be segmented in this kind of way, where you have certain types of el elements of certain data types, such as a person or parts of people and, and so forth, and attributes of people, uh, and those encode certain types of knowledge and belief. And so the, uh, the kid who's choosing this image might draw uh, from that worldview some certain element, you know, such as uh, uh, you know, the white baby doll looks nice, and so they have a social uh, view. Uh, and so this, this is all which is implicit in that image, but just describing it in a little bit more semi-formal way. And so when they integrate that information with the image without deliberation, then they're immediately understanding that baby doll as the one that looks nice. Yeah, so this was just a more structured description of what's happening. Yeah, the formal description doesn't, uh, it, it just allows us to analyze computing systems in a more precise way. At the same time, it, it doesn't, it's not a surrogate for analyzing these sort of things through literature or through thick description or any other kind of method. It's just a different kind of method. And what I think this method uh, allows is uh, uh, you know, the fact that the phantasm describes a way of thinking about uh, you know, blends of you know, this kind of mental imagery, you know, the imagery that we're perceiving with the worldview in a way that's useful for analyzing computing systems. So the concept it emphasizes the role of worldview in understanding these systems. It's in the book described in cog sci terms, so it's pinned down uh, uh, scientifically. And most importantly, it's useful for analyzing very, uh, very formal or, or semi-formal, I, I just mean mathematical or, 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 or programming systems. Yeah, so, so that idea that you can begin to analyze these kind of values in, 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 in the structured way is one of the insights that enabled my work in identity. And the other one is looking at the way that values are built into data structures and algorithms. And, and so I won't go into the detail here. This is some of the theoretical framework. That's you know, the ways that people are looking at how systems of categorization and classification work. Uh, and uh, I'll just move on to you know, some, some of my insights here, which are that regardless of whether you're talking about an online account, or if you're talking about a social uh, uh, media profile or a character, there are some similarities in the way that each of those are represented technically. And so what I mean is on the front end, you might have uh, some text, like text forms and so forth. You might have uh, static assets, you know, graphical assets like photos. And then you might have some modular graphical models. I just mean, say, 3D graphics and so forth. And then data on the back end. Uh, and I'll describe to you what, e what I mean by each of these in a moment. Yeah, so by static assets, what, what I mean is that on, on the front end, you have photos as avatars, uh, say, you know, still images on forums and, and so forth. And uh, these are sites a lot of times where politics are, are exchanged. So somebody creating a, a, a forum avatar for somebody else as, as a favor, right? Or, or judging somebody based on their, their avatar. You know, so you look on ESPN and people are teased, not because of their sports insights, but because of the little picture uh, that's associated with what they're posting there. Right, so, so, so the, and of course these are complex because people might create an avatar in one system, take their favorite game character, use that as their Facebook profile image and so forth, right? So there's a lot that can go, go on in, in these kind of uh, images. 
Right, so flat text profile, uh, you know, this also sounds uh, simple, right? So it could range from uh, you know, some information on Twitter to information on a MUD, you know, a kind of text-based online game. Uh, and and you know, so this is one called Armageddon, in, in which the uh, players describe uh, descriptions of their characters rather than, than just customizing the avatar. But of course, a lot takes, takes place there too. So usually on a MUD, you know, the, the politics of creating your character are defined by, by the rules of, uh, of creating the, these uh, profiles. So for example, in this MUD, if you play as a, uh, a character type called a mole, that's one of the races there, they're described as the, quote, sterile crossbreeds of dwarves and men bred almost solely by Templar slaves and nobles for combat in the arenas of Alanak as well as those in Toluk. Right? And so they actually suggest that because of uh, this characteristic, that if you play this character, you should have a sense of meaninglessness in, in life and, and, and so forth. Right? So it kind of privileges you know, reproduction and, and so forth. And so there's a lot of open-ended possibilities when you can construct your character with just text. But of course, then people tend to go in and put in social constraints to, uh, to, to, constr to, to limit the way that people might, might uh, express themselves through text such as this. Right, and so by, by modular graphics, what I mean uh, is uh, you know, th 3D models or skins on those models or, uh, or sort of paper doll models in, in, in 2D. Yeah, so that's just to say that there's a distinction between all of this is happening on the front end, right? That's what we see. But also, very interestingly, there's a lot that's happening on the back end across all these types of systems, right? So, and so whether you're talking about a game like Elder Scrolls IV uh, uh, Oblivion or uh, Twitter, right, there are stats that accompany you, you know, that on the back end that are associated with your identity. Right, there are formal data, data structures associated with your identity, right? So this, these, these are data structures uh, from uh, Facebook in, in which people are, uh, are identifying gender, uh, as well as in the game Neverwinter Nights, you know, in which there are encodings of race, you know, gender, even blood color, and, and, and so forth. And finally, there are also procedural rules on both sides. You know, so uh, you can see in... Uh, on, on Facebook, there's th this suggestions or recommendations that's algorithmically generated based upon what other people in your feed or other friends like. J similarly, in this game, Elder Scrolls IV Sky uh, uh, Oblivion, the suggestion of, of character is created after you played through a tutorial and then the algorithmically the system looks, did you use a bow more? Did you use a sword more? How did you play? And then suggest the kind of character that you might like to play in the game. Right, so again, the kind of character uh, is, is based, and, and the information about you, is based on algorithmic model. Right, yeah, so again, you see this is automatically generated recommendation page for TV and automatically generated uh, uh, a game profession. And so the insight here is just that uh, we can begin analyzing identity across these different platforms once you realize that they're represented in a similar way across all those different platforms. So you can look at the network of affiliations you have in a game and then make predictions about the network of affiliations you might have in a, in, in a social network. You might look at information about someone in one space and think, well, how, what does that mean about the person in another space? Right? So there are actually a lot of kind of similarities across these platforms. And you know, identity is such a very broad, uh, broad topic, but in fact, within these systems, it's ca social categories are represented in data structures. So unlike in the real world, you can't just uh, pin people down and say, you are in this uh, specific category based on this information about you. Uh, in the digital world, that's actually built into these systems. So the place for us to intervene was to say, actually, these data structures are very limited. You know, they're represented in a very simple way. You know, like you wouldn't imagine you can fully determine someone in the real world by saying, you have this set of 10 characteristics, therefore I know your identity. Or, or you get, you're a friend because I've called you a friend. But in Facebook, joining uh, and becoming a friend is just clicking a button. Right? It's much different than, than in the real world. Yeah, so what we begun to, began to do was just to say, uh, well, what if we replace these systems uh, with more nuanced systems? Yeah, so instead of just determining identity in this very top-down way, we replace it with something that's much more uh, uh, nuanced. And so just to briefly recap you know, the enabling insights here, one is just that this idea of phantasms is useful for analyzing the structure of cultural meanings and values in these systems. And the fact that these systems have shared structures on the back end that allow us to analyze them in a more uniform kind of way. And so now what I want to talk about are particular types of cultural meanings and values related to race and gender that are built into the structure uh, of uh, video games. So take some of this that is a little bit abstract and then pin it down in specific examples. 
Yeah, so to begin with computational identity phantasms, right, uh, first of all, I should say that although I'll focus a little bit on video games today, they're still there in systems such as recommender systems on, in, in Amazon and so forth, where your recommendations and what the system thinks you like and your preferences are based on an algorithm. Yeah, similarly, in, in a game like, uh, uh, you know, like, like Skyrim or Facebook profile, uh, 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 right, we, have, we have similar kind of phenomena taking place. In fact, if you look at the literature on, on recommendation algorithms, Users for whom you, they can't predict what they will like are actually technically called black sheep or gray sheep in, in, in the literature, right? And seen as a problem for the systems, right? So it's not just this creative kind of person, it's actually a problem that needs to be solved. For these black sheep, the, the, then how can we improve the algorithm in order to predict for them as accurately as we can for other type of sheep, right? So, uh, yeah, so that's just to remind you that not all phantasms refer to uh, identity, but we'll focus on that here. And the identity is not limited to race and gender, although I speak about these kind of issues, but again, body language, facial expression, personality, and, and more. And so this is just one example. So this is uh, a problem with identity phantasms. How many people know the game that I've been mentioning, Elder Scrolls IV uh, Oblivion? Right, yeah, so uh, maybe a, a little more than half the people here. Right, and so for the people that aren't familiar with, with the, the Elder Scrolls series, I should mention that, uh, uh, but I mean, th these games are just very broadly influential. So if you just want a very uh, narrow lens on how it's uh, been socially impactful, consider that uh, Star Wars, you know, so that's seen as a socially impactful media product, on its best weekend, so uh, made $7 million. So that's adjusted for inflation, that would be $27.2 million today. Well, Skyrim on the first day made 204 million. That's adjusted for inflation, 217 million dollars. Right. So that's just 27 million versus 217 million dollars of, of, of revenue. Best weekend versus first day. Uh, and uh, so in Sky, in, in Oblivion. You know, some, there's some interesting phenomenon where you have characters that are ostensibly Norwegian called Nords, or ostensibly uh, black characters that are called Red Guards. Actually, the Red Guards are described in very stereotypical terms, right? So they're the centralist stereotype of the black athlete. They're described as the most ta naturally talented warriors in Tamriel. They're physically blessed with hardy constitutions and quickness of foot. So in fact, their bonuses translate into bonuses to their running and jumping abilities within the game, right? Uh, uh, so I, I want to ask the people, you know, so people, have you also played the, the sequel to this game, Skyrim? So how many people know Skyrim? Yeah, so, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm suggesting that there is some kind of stereotype that's built into these systems. Uh, is there, are, say, are the Red Guard or Nord representations improved at all in Skyrim from, from the case here? Uh, uh, yes? Um, not necessarily, because one of the facts in Oblivion is like skill bonuses, so your proficiency in certain activities, so like, you know, you're more capable with a sword or stuff like that, and those bonuses persist in Skyrim as well, where your race is a determinant of your starting skill in different like things. Like Nords are naturally more talented with two-handed weapons and like Red Guards are still more naturally talented with like swords, like one handed and stuff like that. Right, that's a great, that's, it's a great point. So you're saying that you know, based on the race that you choose, you're going to be better at certain things. And if you happen to want to have a Nor ostensibly Norwegian character, but be great at magic, then you're, you're a little bit out of luck if you want to maximize your character as a, as a Nord. Uh, but there were some changes it, between Oblivion and Skyrim. So the default red guard in Skyrim actually looks different. It now looks like this. You know, so this is the red guard with no changes made to it uh, whatsoever. It wasn't customized, right? And so you can ask, is this better or worse than the default representation in Oblivion? So I've been writing about this for a while in game periodicals and other, and other venues, and so I don't know what motivated the particular change here. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but I would actually contend that, 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 that it's neither better nor worse. Because this is, right. So this is the, the front-end representation, right? This is the visual critique. This is like a critique of Laura Croft's body image, uh, right? So it's a fair enough critique. But what I'm interested in here, and these are stats from a different game, uh, from Grand Theft Auto uh, San Andreas. Uh, you know, I'm interested in the back end, you know, the stats. You know, so th and that's exactly the point that was brought up here, is that the differences are encoded into the system itself, right? That they're, they're not just visual differences. Right, and so uh, what I want to focus on in this talk are these kind of uh, back-end stats. And so if you begin to look here, so I'll highlight just one particular line, which is intelligence. That's sort of a gloss. It really uh, uh, impacts your magical ability in the game, but it's labeled intelligence, so a lot of, there, there are a lot of connotations. And you'll notice if you happen to be uh, a Nord or a Red Guard, you're by default 30 points intelligent. 
Whereas if you're a Breton, these are the ostensible French within the game, you're by default 50 points intelligent, <coughs> right? Or uh, an Imperial, which are the Romans, you're by default 40 points intelligent, right? right? So this is a different kind of critique than just the image critique. It doesn't matter what the character looks like. If you're a female orc, you're by default 10 points more intelligent than your male counterpart, right? So this is going you know, you know, behind the scenes and looking at the back end data. But it, the, these kind of phenomena aren't just limited to, uh, to initial stats. They, they also go deeper. You know, so you know, this, these are data structures I, I showed briefly earlier from a game called Neverwinter Nights. How many people have played this game? Right, so it's smaller, but, but a handful of you. So it's an earlier, very influential kind of fantasy role-playing game. And this one actually has data structures that are for race, phenotype, and gender. And so somebody asked me before, is this just my term? Uh, I, I, I sort of glossing this. No, these are actually the names of the data structures within the system that are used by developers. And, and so I would ask you, what impact do you think that changing race has on, uh, on the character? Should changing race change your appearance? Uh, yes? Sorry, I don't to interrupt. I just wondered if um, this has any... If, since Neverwinter Nights is also based on the Dungeons & Dragons rules, um, if there's a sort of way in which this is something that is not necessarily computational in the sense that when you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, you can roll and choose a particular race, and then that has sort of in, uh, in range. Sorry uh, right, that's a good point. So there's a dis distinction. There are fantastic races and races that are based on sort of real-world races, uh, where the Elder Scrolls series has, has both. There are some kind of fictitious creature types as well as hu human types. But of course, even in the fantastic types, and you think about work like Tolkien and The Hobbit, you know, a lot of times uh, you know, the, the othered categories, the monsters, are, are, are seen as kind of stand-in for other categories, in, you know, the barbarians and so forth, in, in the real world. And so let's just say that real-world values end up impacting the kind of racial constructions that are in the game. Uh, uh, but but even, uh, even regard, uh, irregardless of that fact, yeah, interestingly, you know, so just to answer my own question, changing race, in fact, doesn't ch in the data structure, doesn't even change the appearance of your character. Right? So you know, what race does is uh, it actually is based on Dungeons & Dragons, like you mentioned. It, uh, it impacts issues such as items that have racially based bonuses. So some items might work better for elves, for example, within the game. Right? So it's very far from what we might see as, as uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are a range of definitions of something like race and ways to challenge it even as a category genetically, but regardless of your definition, you probably don't think about it as something like bonus to using a particular type of sword. <laughs> right. right. And phenotype, you know, what, what, what does phenotype mean? Actually, in this game, it just refers to whether characters are of a large or normal shape, but it doesn't have a, an effect to the character except for how the character looks. What about gender? How many genders do you think there are in the back end of the game? Uh, any guesses? All right, so two. Uh, right, I think that's a fair enough uh, guess, considering a lot of uh, uh, standard gen gender binaries in these type of systems. Actually, there are five different genders. So they're uh, they listed in this order. Male, female, both, other, and none. But if you are male, uh, both, other, or none, you have by default a male body type within the game. Right, so that means there are five different genders, 80% of which are apparently male within, within the game. <laughs> right, right. So that's just to say that a lot of strange kind of values you know, implicitly find their way into the back end, the data structures of these systems. And there are broad implications of, of, of this kind of uh, effect. Right, you know, so this is just to give you a sense of, of scope of the problem. So these are stats collected by a Children Now organization and the Pew Foundation uh, and, and presented by Mia Consalvo and Watkins and, and, and Everett. You know, but, this, you know, but I'll just highlight a few of, a few of these stats. You know, these are based on surveys of video game characters and, and mainstream console games, you know, most popular types of, uh, of, of games, hundreds of games. And so just, just to pull out one of these, uh, more than 90% of black women characters function as props, bystanders or victims yeah, in, in these analyses. And African-American women are far more likely than any other group to be victims of violence. 90% of African-American females are victims of violence. And it's no better for other, other women, such as white. I mean, it's, it's better, but it's, not, it's no walk in the park, right? 45% I mean, being, being victims uh, w within the game. So that's just cherry picking a particular kind of stat. But uh, Watkins and Everett actually call these kind of games racialized pedagogical zones, because there's spaces in which people then uh, enter and uh, perform you know, di different, different aspects of, of, uh, of race and ethnicity within, the, within these systems. And uh, I've identified in my work a number of different kind of limitations of these kind of systems. I mean, another example would be in San Andreas, uh, uh, the Grand Theft Auto. You drive around in the city, and you see that there are a lot of loitering African-American males within the environment. And you think, why, why, are, why are they there? Actually, for the game mechanical reason, 
you can recruit them to help you in, in, in gang activities, right? So in game mechanical terms, it means that you have to have them visible in order to, to select them and get them to help you in what you want them to do. But socially, it looks as if there are these bodies, you know, black male bodies that are just strewn throughout the city with no employment, nothing to do, except for wait to engage in gang activities, right? So again, that's an algorithmic, uh, uh, it's something that's happening on the back end, an algorithmic side that has uh, impacts in the game as a, as a place to teach how race is performed. Right, and, and so uh, there, I won't go through all these limitations, but just some of the attributes are reduced down to, uh, social attributes are reduced to statistics. You know, there are, uh, these are very hierarchical structures. It's hard to represent blending Id identities or transitioning between identities. Right, so there are a number of kind of limitations to, to these, types of, uh, these types of systems. Changes is often limited, to, in, in mainstream games at least, to space exploration, combat, and or acquiring objects, virtual objects. And, and so in, in short, uh, I think we can do and we must do uh, a lot better th than the current systems are doing. A and again, this is also not a utopian vision in the sense that every game should have every option for every person, but rather I think there's a potential for the these systems to operate in a much more nuanced way like you find in other media. So if you look at the work of Octavia Butler, the social science for a very particular kind of nuanced social critique, I mean, uh, 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 science fiction for, for social critique, right, it actually expands the ex expressive ra range of these games. And it doesn't mean you always want everything to be a sort of diversity training tool. Actually, you might want to implement something that's dystopian. So implement racial profiling in Grand Theft Auto as a form of social critique, right? It has to be curated in an effective way, but actually can convey some of the systematicity of these types of experiences. And so I'll tell you a little bit about what we've been doing in, in this area as, as our attempts to do a little bit better. So I've been running a, a project called the Advanced Identity Representation Project. It's a National Science Foundation supported five-year project that, that uh, develops uh, uh, new models, you know, so new types of theory for thinking about identity online, uh, new platforms for building uh, systems of identity in games and social media, and finding new applications, specific games or social media works. And in terms of system building, there are a couple of types that we build. One, our system to analyze identity phenomena, and the other, are, uh, and this type of analysis that we've done informs our ability to model these phenomena, so create new models to be used in games and so forth. So I'll tell you first about one of these, one of these analysis-oriented systems. So uh, uh, we use a, t a technique from AI and machine learning. It's a clustering algorithm called archetypal analysis. And I'll tell you just a little bit about what this does. So the point of this is that, you know, so I, I, I described uh, just using observation, you know, some of the stereotypes that are built into the system, we also can prove mathematically and statistically the way that certain stereotypes are built into the system. And so that's what the pro pro project is here. Can, can we begin to computationally show some of the inequity that's built into these systems? And so uh, uh, I'll explain a little bit about archetypal analysis. You know, so it's been used in, say, sports metrics and so forth. You might think about it this way. Clustering algorithms, yeah, most of them will look for similarities between certain users or, or players and then cluster them together based on shared characteristics. Archetypal analysis works differently. It looks for archetypes that can define the entire range of users. So a way, a way to describe this would be, think about NBA players. It's been used in sport metrics, as I said. You might have one archetype, which is three-point shooter, another archetype, which is a star that can sort of do everything, and another archetype that's bench warmer. And then every player can be seen as some combination of those three. So you might say uh, someone like LeBron James is the, is, is the star, and, and then you have others that are like Kyle Korver is a three-point shooter, and then other players would just be somewhere in between. And so what we actually did was run archetypal analysis uh, on, on, the, on the Skyrim data that I mentioned. You know, so, you know, and so that's all of the, the, the race and gender data for, for default characters within, within the system. And, uh, uh, and, and so what do you do first is find what's the best number of archetypes to describe the data. We chose three archetypes for our purposes. And, uh, and I, I won't describe all of this in complete depth, but just to say that, so you have one archetype, you know, so you, these are strength, intelligence, willpower, agility, speed, endurance, personality, height, and weight. And so you see the first one has a lot of strength. The second one has a lot of intelligence and willpower. The next one has a lot of agility and speed. Yeah, so they roughly, you know, so this is statistically, uh, we find that there are these three different archetypes that uh, correspond to fighter, very physical type, uh, intelligence, kind of magic user type, and thief type. That's just there in, in the data. And uh, rather than looking at it as a table like this, we've I plotted it out in a, uh, this is called a ternary plot diagram. So you have each of the archetypes here, right? So the fighter, the mage, and the thief on these different points, and different 
character types, you have reds are males and black are females, are plotted here uh, according to what archetype they represent. So you'll see here that uh, uh, the, the males uh, here, uh, male Nord and male Breton, these are archetypal of fighters and archetypal uh, physical fighters intelligence maids, mages, where the only one where there's a female archetype that fits it is the thief. Right. Uh, uh, also, for red guards, you'll see that both male and female red guards uh, are very close to the, to the fighter type. They have no attributes of the intelligence mage there. Yeah, so you be can begin to see when these are plotted out statistically that there are actual kind of biases that are built into the, si the statistics of, of the system. So some of the kind of results that, uh, yeah, so are there any questions about this, about this diagram, what it, what it represents? All right, so, uh, so, so because one of the points are you know, that they're actual, uh, they're actual statistical distributions and numerical attributes that, that uh, in looking at stereotypical role-playing roles, it encode uh, uh, stereotypes in the real world. Yes, so African-American red guards are stereotyped as a physical fighter archetype with absolutely no characteristics of the intelligence type. And bias towards the male gender could be observed because uh, uh, if you notice uh, that, that the female characters are further away from the archetypes on the, edge, uh, on the points compared to the male characters. Right, uh, so that, that's just one example. Well, we've done a number of kind of analyses, say predicting uh, you know, not just these kind of stereotypes, but you know, say using, using social networking data to say, how does someone perform social status in a virtual world, say buying expensive virtual items and, and, and so forth. We've done a lot of work with analytics, but we've also done some work with system building to model uh, uh, and uh, create new expressive games and experiences. So I'll, I'll finish up telling you about one of these. So we have an engine called uh, Chimeria, and what Chimeria does is model gradients of identity as well as, uh, as uh, naturalization. So what do these terms even mean? Well, I'll, gi I'll give you a an illustration first. So imagine you're playing a game in which you're uh, first playing as a knight, and then you decide just to dabble a little bit in magic. And so you have a little bit of abilities from both. But then you, you, you're a little confused and bored through playing magic, and you decide to go back to just using your physical abilities but that's lost its luster, and now you decide to go, as they say, full mage. Right. So you have another kind of possibility. You know, let's say you're listening to Spotify or your favorite music uh, recommender system. You listen to punk rock. You begin to dabble in jazz. You, you, listen, you go back to punk rock and then go full jazz, as they say. Right. Yeah, so you can see the structure of the story is, are the same. Yeah, so what our system does is model changes between categories. Are you moving from the center of categories to the margins of categories? Do you have multiple categories? How are your categories changing over time? Are you becoming a member of one from the other? Is it going back and forth? So we're mathematically modeling all of these kind of phenomena to create more nuanced experiences in games and social media. So, you know, so that's what I mean by category gradients and dynamics. And it's, the system is called the Chimeria platform. So I'll tell you just about one game that we built yeah, as an example using the system. You could have any number of categories, but in this case we chose two uh, particular categories and we created a game scenario. You're trying to get into a castle. You, there's a guard in front of you that's from one clan, you're from another one, and you want to somehow convince them that you're enough like them to let you in. So in our, in our game, we had two different categories. We called them Sylvans and Brushwoods. Right? Sylvans are this kind of aesthetically oriented category. They like fine clothing and elaborate uh, poetry and this sort of thing. And Brushwoods like earthy, homespun clothing and good stories by the fireplace and, and, and so forth. Right. You could reskin, you remember the front end and the back end are different. You could reskin this and rename them in, in any number of ways. So we could have made uh, Brushwoods and Sylvans look completely different uh, than, than I described. It could be more socially real than looking like elves and hobbits, uh, as we do in our example. But, but, that, but uh, that's just, uh, uh, and we could have had more categories again. In our si I'll, I'll tell you more about it later, but maybe I'll first I'll run a, a demo of the system because uh, there are a number of different possibilities in the responses of the guard and in, and in the outcome uh, of the interaction. So I'll let you help me out in playing through. Right, so this, this scenario is called Gatekeeper. Okay, so the Sylvan and Brushwood have been at war for ages. The Sylvan, known as a tall people on average, are sometimes judged from afar to be lovers of finery and elaborate poetry. The brushwood, known as small people on average, are sometimes judged from afar to be fond of earthy homespun fabrics and good hearth tales. 
hailing from the Sylvan tribes, remember you were the, you know, the elf-like, aesthetically oriented Sylvan uh, from, that, from that tribe, and you stand before the gate of a keep. Your need to, you need to enter and that need is dire. You are tall, wearing fine clothes and articulate. You see a brushwood guard with sturdy armor. And so what do you do? The guard before you looks preoccupied. So do you, the guard's looking away from you. Do you dust off your boots? Do you adjust your clothes in your gilded mirror? Do you untuck your tunic? Or do you hide your fine jewelry? So what do you do? All right, so let's dust off uh, boots. Oh, he doesn't like that. <laughs> right, so it's modeled to look like a visual novel style game, like you might have in a handheld system. But you think to yourself, I'm being true to myself, uh, a true uh, Sylvan. The guard before you looks, uh, uh, has a wary expression. The guard asks you a question. We don't see many um, uh, new folk around here. Did you travel far to get here? And it seemed like he was about to say, we don't see many Sylvan around here. So do you say, tis not far from home? Uh, oh yes, good man, this is a strange land indeed. New, I'm from just around the way. <laughs> or, I'm from a little ways off indeed. <laughs> so, so what do you say? Uh, all right. He likes that. <laughs> all right. So, and you think to yourself, I'm hoping to get in. The guard before you looks curious. Do you speak to him in your own language, a Sylvan for a pleasant day to you? Do you say some weather we're having today, good day, or I hope you are faring well, a star shines upon the hour of our meeting? <laughs> okay, so you're very formal. You know, but he, doesn't, he doesn't like this. But you think you're being true to yourself, a true Sylvan. So you're sort of going back and forth. He looks curious. Do you speak to him in your own language again? Do you say hello, greetings, brother, or good day, Brushwood? All right, so uh, greetings, brother. Yeah, he, he likes the, uh, the brother man greeting. And I'm hoping to get in, you think to yourself. And okay, I guess you can come in. He says, finally. And you think, the guard let me in somehow. You know, Sylvan do seem kind of unwelcome here. And so you, you kind of were going back and forth, right? You weren't just answering everything the way that he liked. So you're, okay, somehow he let me in. So let's, let's run through this uh, one, one more time. And I'll show you a little bit about how it works as we do that too, with different answers. So there's a narrative structure, so we're representing different types of clauses. It's based on social linguistic studies of narratives of personal experience. That just means you tell a story about yourself. There's a set structure behind peop how people usually tell these kind of stories. And so we have these, mo these, these tests to see if you're a member of the category, right? There's an accepted category and a stigmatized category. Uh, and well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about this you know, later, but this is to say that there's a lot going on behind the scenes here. And so let's say, we're, we're going to adjust our clothes in the gilded mirror, right? And, and you see that we're less uh, accepted. Our trajectory is going down. I'll turn that off now. Uh, we're, we're calling him small one and speaking in our own language. Uh, straightening up to be much taller than him. But what? you would have thought, what, which, why did he let you in, right? You, he wasn't happy with anything. But he says, come in, it's nice to have a little sylvan flavor around here, right, <laughs> right, right. And so, yeah, so, and you feel like, okay, well, I taught the guard a little something about sylvans today, right? So you feel like there's been some, some, kind, of a, some kind of intervention. Right. Yeah, and so, and so just to explain a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes there, we're actually tracking uh, your naturalization trajectory. So if you're increasingly monotonically increasingly here, just uh, without, uh, uh, without any kind of issue, uh, your, your membership in that accepted category, then it's gonna respond in one way. If you're fluctuating, there'll be another, another kind, kind of response. Yeah, and, and so, and these responses are actually aligned with the kind of study of, of passing and, and stigma from, from uh, Irving Goffman and others in the social sciences. So what you got was called, what Goffman calls stigma allure. Right, you're sort of exoticized, right? Okay, it's nice to have one of you around here, a kind of tokenism, uh, right? Uh, but, but you could also uh, have similarly been excluded because you performed the stigmatized category. So you have all of these types of thematic endings that, that are associated uh, with, these, with these different kind of ways to play through it, right? Disidentifying, you know, so that's, for example, you might be illiterate, but wear glasses so that people imagine that you're literate, you know? So you have all these kind of possibilities for changing the kind of uh, interactions and responses you could, you know, some games do model stereotyping, like Dragon Age has stereotyping against elves, but it's all pre-written and hard-coded, right? It's branching dialogue. In this case, you could just instantiate one city that says Brushwoods are privileged, another one that says Sylvans are privileged. You could change different non-player characters respond to you in different ways, 
right? And you can change the ways that these different category tests and naturalization trajectories impact your outcomes. So there's a lot that you can do with this type of system. But we've also built a social media application, and so I'll be in Professor Parham's class tomorrow. If people are interested, I can show this, how this works. But we actually do the same thing using a photo wall. Instead of changing anything about how you look or your membership in a category, uh, as we just saw, your photo wall changes to reflect your musical taste, and you have these kind of bots that respond and suggest different music, play you different clips from YouTube, uh, and, uh, and uses outside data from the All Music Guide to customize recommendations and, and describe music, and so your category is changing. So again, it's, and we have also a 3D version, you can go online and you actually can change the way your 3D avatar looks. So there are a number of things we can do. That's just to say that our system is a back-end engine that can model these changes. It's not restricted just to that one game. Uh, so remember uh, my research contribution I stated at the beginning. Yeah, so uh, this is toward a con concluding and the broader implications of my work. So the work enables us to understand social and cultural phenomena of identity at the code level. So I, desc I described a little bit of that to you. And we build computational models and systems to analyze. You saw that case with the archetypal analysis and to model identi identity phenomena, as you saw with uh, Chimeria Gatekeeper. Uh, so to conclude, you remember me, right? The phantasm back at the beginning of the talk. Well, phantasms like this often remain invisible and implicit for, for users, right? They're built into data structures. So this is a data structure for a me, right? Is girl, right? It's a Boolean, you know, off or, 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 or on, true or false. Right, yet the, the phantasms described in these systems, the way that these systems reveal phantasms, are computationally modeled and explicitly designed for studying cultural meanings in digital media. Uh, and so just to, to conclude, what I think that I've, I've, uh, I've done is introduce an approach to uh, computational modeling that provides means of analyzing and, and modeling cultural phenomena like social identity, as we've discussed today, at, at, the, at the code level. And, and, and again, this kind of issues and phantasms aren't restricted just to identity, but any kind of cultural values. You know, so even the eBay seller it could have been encoded in a much different way besides just how many users have walked away happy. Right? There's so many different sort of things that we can do. So this is just a prompt to begin to think about the way that values are built on the back end of these systems. And this approach, what I've called computational computing, I believe enables us to better understand and convey cultural meanings as they're then implemented through algorithms and data structures in computational media. Thank you. So, and so I'm happy to uh, engage in a Q&A session and answer any questions or entertain any comments that you might have. Okay, uh, yes. Uh, do you think any versions of Grand Theft Auto are effective at creating a dystopian atmosphere? All right, uh, I think so. I mean, I, I think, uh, I mean, much of those games, so they're both uh, satirical as well as you know, somewhat dystopian. I think one of the kind of, so there are kind of critiques uh, of, uh, a few types of critique of the, of the game. Yeah, so one, one is that, yeah, a lot of the satire in the game is built into sort of ancillary parts of the experience. You know, so what I mean is you're driving around listening to the radio, and the radio plays highly socially critical kind of commentary, but meanwhile, everything you have to do in order to progress in the game you know, relates to a, a, a very narrow frame of you know, conducting violence, uh, violent actions, and, 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 so, and so forth. Right, so, it, so it operates on both of these different levels, but the level of agency, I think, is, mu is very limited. So if you think about Grand Theft Auto 4, uh, you know, the character in Nico, and others, others, have others have raised this critique too, he's constantly saying, I don't want to be in the gangster, uh, I don't want to be in the criminal you know, life, I want to get out of this, why do I have to do this? But in order to progress in the game, if you want to move through the story, you have to perform, the, perform those actions. There's no way to escape from, do, from doing so. So there's, there's a disconnect you know, between, uh, uh, between you know, what the character is saying on the narrative level and what's happening at the game mechanical level there. You know, so I think the more that you can you know, align this, then actually will perform as better social critique. Uh, and, and, and also, you know, just the way that you, you progress and move th and advance through the, through the goal and the goal orientation of the game you know, should be better aligned, I think, with the social critique. One of my friends described the, the game as sort of the, uh, the birth of a nation of games. You know, so you can think about it because it has the, you know, you know, the, the, the same kind of, uh, it, it's been uh, maligned for the, for the same kind of social issues that are within the game. At the same time, technically, as an open world game, it's been, it's been very influential. Uh, uh, yes, here. Well, we'll move across this way. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, and I'm sorry that I blurted out about D&D, &D, but I think one of the things I was thinking through when you were talking, and you mostly answered what I, um, what I was thinking about. Uh, this was really fantastic, by the way. Um, 
I did want to ask about this idea that I think what I was getting at with the D and D example was something like there's two elements there. So there's the element of chance. Obviously, you throw the dice and you get whatever stat it is, and then you work with that. Um, but there's also the user decision, and then that is in both of those things are in response to the sort of architecture in general of the game. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about was in what way is the sort of analysis that you're putting forth here about these sort of algorithmic distinctions in games, um, particularly, for example, the idea that there are five genders, right? How do you see the relationship between, as a programmer, looking at something and saying, okay, we're going to have five genders and trying to get that information to the users? So when you make mods, for example, if you have, um, you may not know playing the game that there are five genders. You may just play the game thinking there are two or possibly three. It's only in the level of code that you would realize that there are five. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see the sort of statistical um, algorithmic kind of processes that you're talking about. What is the difference between experiencing those on a programming and as a programmer, as a game maker, versus kind of experiencing those as a user, as a game player, and what kind of options you might have? All right, so there, there are a couple of points mixed, mixed in there. You know, so one is about user experience you know, versus you know, so what users are aware of versus what's happening behind the scenes. And, and the other one is the relationship between developers and, and the kind of values that are built into the system. You know, and so with, with the, the former, you know, you know, so user, user experience, yeah, so one is there are also different types of users. Yeah, so Bartles and Yi and others have described different player types. You know, some players are described as explorers versus achievers. For achievers, it's very important because achievers are the one that sort of want to min-max, as they say, you know, your character. So you can optimize your stats for best performance. So for an achiever who plays, uh, uh, you know, so just the power player who plays a game like uh, uh, most RPGs, uh, uh, or you know, particular Skyrim or Oblivion or others, I don't want to just pick on that particular game, but actually one of the things it does well is it has a diversity of types of representation. You know, so what I'm trying to do is to say, how can we push that diversity further and so it can be even more, more expressive? You know, you know, but, you know, but those type of players are never going to play uh, a Breton if they want to be a warrior, you know, or a Red Guard if they want to be an intelligence-oriented magic user. You know, yeah, so, yeah, so, so that's one of the types of impact. You know, also, uh, in, in speaking with uh, Professor Parham today, a lot of times yeah, in, in games this can be used for social critique. So she, she mentioned a very uh, a, a, a wonderful example in the Assassin's Creed games, uh, and, and, and you know, w where you know, depending on the type of person looking at you and their ethnicity and whether you want to maintain your invisibility or not, you know, that, that they're, you know, that, 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 that's built into game mechanics, right? And so, and again, it's this idea of games as racially pedago racialized pedagogical zones. I would move away from just race and say even identity pedago pedagogical zones, right? They're places that teach you how to perform. And so the impact of the algorithm is, it impacts your agency within the system. And for the, sec the second, and I connect agency, not just to agency with the interface, but then when you go outside the game, what kind of agency do you have in the real world to think about yourself? Because researchers such as Jeremy Valenson at Stanford and others have shown that people change their real world behaviors based upon their experiences in virtual worlds. If you play an avatar that you deem attractive, later on you change your interpersonal distance. You, you talk to people, you get a little closer to people when you talk to them. Yeah, right. If you're a taller avatar, then you speak in a more confident way when you leave the system. Right. So there are a number of kind of effects that, that, they, that, that have been shown that actually carry over into the world, real world you know, there. And so with regard to, your, uh, to, to the second part of your question, you know, there's a couple of different ways that developer values get into these kind of systems. And part of it is that you know, what, I'm, what I'm emphasizing is not just code as if it uh, is acultural and stands there on its own. Really, I'm looking at how do the values of, uh, of developers and even systems that have long existed, historical values, like in Dungeons and Dragons, get built into these systems. What's that process of translation and realizing that those values are, are, are there? It's not enough just to say, oh, well, it comes from Dungeons and Dragons, so therefore we don't need to perform any cultural analysis. Where do those values come from and what do they mean, right? And, and, and sometimes they're actually built into the systems as systems of desire. That's intentionally, right? So, you know, this is the whole point with, with Gamergate. People say, we want that in our games. These are the games that sell to us. These are, this is what we want to see. I don't care if, it's, uh, if, if they're sexist or discriminatory or oppressive in some sort of way. And so, of course, developers who want to make money will create games that cater to that kind of population. 
right? right? Yeah, yeah. So sometimes it's conscious in that way, but a lot of times, like with the five gender example, it's probably just implicit. People are just thinking about what makes sense to them and building that, and that's just using their sort of you know, tacit cultural models. Yeah, so both, both types of, uh, you, know, you know, and of course you can also explicitly design for social critique, like the example that Professor Parham gave in, in, in uh, Assassin's Creed. You know, so they're both con conscious as well as tacit values that can be built into these. And what I'm trying to do is give a way to analyze both. Uh, yes? Oh uh, yeah, um, building off the D&D example, uh, it's an interesting thing because uh, you know, D&D came under pretty harsh criticism for its uh, use of different like averages of like percentages you get for statistics that differ between genders. And it, I don't know about the most of the latest edition, but I'm pretty sure they actually don't have that anymore in the game. And on the same note, in Skyrim actually, you've seen the statistics become less complex because they don't, they no longer include stats like intelligence or things like that anymore. They just measure like, you know, your resources, like your health or your stamina, your mana, and your skills. And, um, you know, in Oblivion, for instance, you'd see like the difference of like, whether my women might be rated lower in strength than men for a race on average, versus like you know you don't see that anymore. That distinction more in Skyrim. And I, I just thought it was interesting to bring up that point that uh, you know in the in the role playing games, both the video games and the um, you know the the, uh, the traditional pen and paper games, that was a critique against them that they've actually moved and they've changed by erasing that distinction. And you know you also see in Skyrim I mentioned before that the erasure of those uh, elements like intelligence or strength as like statistics that define your character. And I was just wondering um, kind of what your thoughts are about like how those elements, rather than like being talked about in a different way or being detached from race, they're actually being removed. And like you know some people talk about it as like you know in service to a more casual game experience, but there's also that social critique element. I was just wondering kind of what you think about that. Right, that's a, it's an excellent question, right? So, so there, are, there have been some changes, in some cases, removing attribute, uh, uh, the connection between attributes and, uh, and say race or gender, or other kind of normative identity categories. And then in some cases, making it, it you'd say more transparent you know, you know, by removing the intermedi intermediary of stats like intelligence. Because if all intelligence does is mean you're better at magic, why not just say you're better at magic, right? And, and, uh, and so, uh, so there are two components, and I think one is what I just mentioned, that's increasing transparency I don't think that's just for casual gamers. I think that makes it in, in, in some way easier you know, that, that without uh, the complexity, the underlying complexity doesn't change you know, that much. You know, it's just that you're realizing that these stats are, are, are these attributes are kind of a gloss. You know, but but there is a form, there is a type of social critique there. You know, you know that yeah, and you know, although it's you could say if you think of that about this as essentialist, that means that there are essential characteristics associated with each race or group. It's moving essentialism away from kind of bell curve, intelligence, and strength, and moving it towards a kind of a cultural uh, essentialism. That means if you're from this culture, you might be better at this certain kind of skill. That is still a kind of essentialist construction. What would be better to me is if you had those associated with uh, character background. So regardless of what background, what kind of uh, race or gender you choose, then you have different kind of background. And some games actually do something like this, you know. But yeah, you know, and then based on the kind of background you choose, then you have maybe some bonuses to skills. That's a very small intervention that I think makes it a bit more uh, uh, more socially responsible there. But there are also issues. Uh, I have a student, you know, she, th th that uh, a former graduate student that was very interested in, the, in these kind of topics. She participates on the Border House blog, uh, asks about a lot of issues of, of gender fluidity in games and so forth. And one of her, her points was that in a game like Fallout 3, which also is equitable between uh, uh, between genders, right? It just in, uh, it's a inverts things. Like if you go into some room and you're female versus male, then they just uh, use uh, female-oriented pronouns and, and so forth. But what she found was that this game uh, has uh, actually, I think it was in, in uh, New Vegas, you know, the, the sequel. To, uh, and you, if you enter, it has uh, representations of brothels with, within the game. If the character enter, in, enters, and these are mainstream console games, if you enter one of these spaces as a woman or a man, you're, you're propositioned by the people that are there. But in the real world, you know, these are very gender types of experiences. And so her critique was that, in fact, there should be a difference of, of gender you know, based on this experience. You shouldn't just uh, you enter this kind, uh, this kind of sorted space as uh, a male or a female and have a parallel experience you know, you know, there. You should actually have a more nuanced kind of experience that can actually raise these kind of issues. So sometimes the approach of just saying, let's just equalize everything, at least in, in her critique, it, it's, it's not sufficient. Uh, well, I, I can get back to you, but let me uh, answer more questions too first. Uh, come here and then here. 
Um, you touched on this briefly when you referenced Dragon Age and the representation of the elves as being uh, discriminated against. And I was just sort of wondering what your thoughts are on like the notion of sort of metaphorical representations of real world like cultural and like societal issues in that. For example, um, in the Elder Scrolls series, the other dark skinned race, the Dunmer, are at the center of a big you know, the Elder Scrolls three, they are sort of in charge of this slave owning society, and then in the Elder Scrolls five, they are highly discriminated against in Gordon of the Ghettos. I was sort of wondering what your thoughts are on that sort of abstraction of real social issues and stereotypes, etc., into fantastical races and situations. Right, that, that, that's a good. It's a good question, and. and uh, and, and one that I love because a lot of the systems we produce, your know, imagination is in the lab name, and so I'm very interested in imaginative constructions for social critique. Uh, and, and also these kind of strategies, I mean, there's a number of different kind of strategies that, that fall under what you're calling ab 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 abstracting strategies. And they can go back even to older cultural studies, you know, like, the, like the Birmingham School, you know, Stuart Hall talks about strategies of, of inversion and, 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 and so forth, where you say invert social hierarchies. You know, so so there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, uh, of research on, on these kind, kind of strategies. And some that are more nuanced, so I, I know in, uh, in, in Samuel Ardelany, he will do some blending of categories in, in his work, say Tales of Neverion series, uh, are, uh, 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 where you'll have, uh, uh, you know, say, characters that, uh, you know, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed barbarian boy with sandy skin, and you know, everything is kind of, is kind of mixed together, or a woman that uses a, you know, a woman's blade, which is a kind of forked blade that can catch other blades between it, and this sort of, you know, so he has a lot of this, this kind of this sort of thing that, that you're talking about. At the same time, you know, sometimes people also say, All right, well, it's great that you're doing this kind of a, a imaginative construction, you know, so I mean, I should say first, you know, we do, so we use this kind of strategy sometimes in our systems, and not just in versions, but you, you, I think you can create very particular kind of worlds for a specific critique when you can create it from your imagination. That's a little bit different than when you have to create something that's social in socially realist mode, because then people will, will criticize it for its fidelity. To, to, you know, if you're creating something like Precious, you know, the movie, right? So where, where it's supposed to be like this is the true story of uh, of life in the ghetto yeah, and and somebody who's abused and all, and all these sort of things. If it doesn't ring true, then that social realist mode is seen to, to fail sometimes. And also, I think that people from uh, diverse backgrounds are sometimes restricted. You know, sort of like social realism is in vogue for, for these groups, and and so you're always supposed. To, I mean, that's that's happened a lot of time in, in hip hop music. Well, you know, when Tupac is very popular and this sort of thing, and you know, it's it's supposed to be a signifier for the authentic voice of what's really happening. And so I also like work where people can have a more expansive way to engage the world. You know, so that's why a lot of times I refer to you know, speculative fiction writers and magic realism and this sort of thing because I think you can do a very precise critique when you just. I mean, Ellison, Invisible Man, even it's a modernist work, but it's but almost like science fiction in, in a way, and the way it constructs invisibility is such a more nuanced kind of critique than I think it would be possible if it had to be strictly socialist work. So I love to do that sort of thing, but at the same time, like I'm, that's part of the point of the three skinny example, you could also use these systems to create a very social, social realistic or natu nat nat naturalistic kind of work. And I think both strategies are, are necessary. I just, in my own work, you know, we've done a system called mimesis that's about uh, microaggression, like everyday covert forms of discrimination, you know, like, uh, even model minority you know, discrimination, like saying to an Asian American, like, oh, you must be good at math, or you speak English so well, you know, these, these sort of things that are you know, cumulatively actually harmful and detrimental to health and happiness, you know, according to the research in, clin in clinical psychology, but showing how these are systematic experiences. But we did it using an underwater world. You encounter different sea creatures that represent different fa families of microaggression. You know, one of them, it's an alien in one's own land, and you, you see the seahorse, and like, oh, what, you look so exotic, you octopus. What are you doing around here? Can I touch your, your tentacles, <laughs> and you know, this, you know, this sort of thing. Or, and another one, the shark is, assumes you're a criminal and says, uh, uh, I hope you're not up to no good. A and uh, you know, so it's a kind of like touching a handbag type, type scenario. And so we use the, the fantasy of the underwater scenario, but actually they're based on clinical psychology research about how people respond to, the, to, these, to, these, to these settings. And so uh, that, that's a, a long way to say that I, I, I think that that kind of abstraction is, is a great kind of approach. You can do very targeted and, and nuanced work that way, but also when you focus, focus on back-end systems, you're not limited to that kind of approach. All right. So my thank you so much. My question has to do with um, how you how you envision and how you see the kind of reach outside of the academy of this work. I mean, it's obvious from the Canary example you gave us that there is kind of social critiques that are demonstrated through engaging performance of, of players, right? And I think that's just fantastic. 
So uh, do, you, do you see an activism role? Are people engaging from your lab, kind of engaging this work and putting it out there? Right. Right, yeah, so there's a, there's a few kind of ways that, the, that this uh, unfolds, you know, so you know, one very obvious way is just uh, students come from the, from the lab and go off into industry, you know, so one, you know, one of my students went, you know, became a, a, a game designer for the popular game Sunset Overdrive, and he wrote, you know, he let me know about some of the, you know, the, you know, you know the nuanced ways the avatar generation works in that system, and so I think just people being aware and going out to the industry that has an, a, an impact. You know, the Chimera system, you know, so, you know, say, reserving rights through patents and this, this sort of thing to use it and license it for, for, uh, for purposes that we deem to be, to, to be effective. You know, I think that, that's another kind of possibility you know, there. And in particular, I've been very excited about applications for education, you know, for broadening participation, you know, thinking about you know, how, how virtual representations can help with uh, yeah, yeah, helping people to see themselves and lear uh, as learners and doers, especially of STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Uh, and, and so yeah, adaptive learning that can respond to your cultural identity, you know, that, that's another kind of application uh, of, of these kind of systems. I mean, indie games, yeah, and there's activist type, type games that then push you back outside to reflect upon your real condition. You know, I think that's another kind of application. And then just, uh, uh, of, of course, yeah, and also expanding the expressive range even of what, what you know, mainstream games can do because sometimes uh, uh, people might be interested in doing it and, and you, know, uh, you know, people might create certain games just because it's a conventional, but if you have systems, you know, let's say having graphic engines like Unity and the Unreal Engine helps game developers with much more ease to create 3D virtual worlds. So a system like Chimera is actually a social, uh, you could look at it as a social phenomenon engine. And so when you can codify some of this in engines, then the expressive range of systems ranging from indie games or social media up through AAA titles can become uh, much, more, uh, uh, much more nuanced and, and advanced. And, and you know, that, that's one of the sort of the contributions I think we're, we're doing. And then finally, I guess also I'll add, just giving a, a language and terminology through phantasm and so forth where people can begin to point to these issues and say, these values are built in behind the scenes. And then you can have people that, you draw upon the wisdom of p researchers in humanities and social sciences to then build the connections and say, well, this phenomenon that I study exists here, but now I have a language to show how it's built in at the code level or the hardware level, yeah, if, if, uh, if you're interested in going either further under the hood. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so based off of your introduction and the kind of feedback loop that can happen between the cold hard sciences and the humanities, um, and given your admirable and I think really important call to, we need to get better not just in video game design, but in filmmaking and literature and stuff that's more rooted in the humanities. I'm, I'm wondering what you think the kind of differences in climate um, in terms of maybe credibility might be. So for instance, you can have somebody who is a naturally gifted writer who can imagine a really speculative, entirely new, well-developed world and do so with a, for instance, unreliable narrator voice that doesn't tip over into it just being something that's seen as being a bad writing style right. or something that's unbelievable. But for video game design, and I don't know much about this, there seems to be a more kind of strict training process of you have to go to school in this and then you have to learn this, and it seems less possible for someone to just be kind of a maverick coder or video game designer and be picked up by one of those companies and be able to translate these ideas that may or may not be trained in, for instance, your IC lab into a game that they have the ability to work on. So, I don't know, I, I guess I'm just wondering about that balance and how the differences culturally, climate-wise, between the humanities and the cold hard sciences, if we're trying to combine the two. Uh, right, it's, it's, a, it's a good question, although, I mean, it, you know, I, I also would yeah, in, in reflection, you know, question you know, the nature of the sciences as cold and hard, or the humanities as warm and soft, and this, you know, this, you know, this sort of dichotomy, right? Because as you see here, I mean, there, those stereotypes are out there. You know, I've encountered faculty members uh, that even talking to an AI professor, well, you know, I do ro robotics, the hard stuff. You know, so you know, sometimes those th those kind of stereotypes persist. But we're trying to also break down those preconceptions to say that usually the reason technical systems fail is 
are a lot of times they're actually social reasons. They're not technical reasons. You know, so you know, yeah, that means it behooves people that are working in engineering you know, to collaborate with uh, social scientists or human uh, humanities researchers, you know, or pick up those skills themselves, and, and vice versa. Right? Increasingly, people in say literary and cultural studies should also a at least have some degree of procedural literacy. So, you know, it doesn't mean you have to program in you know, a number of languages as, as a profession, but I think the procedural literacy and computational literacy, uh, you know, those are imperatives. I think socially. You know, in general now, you know, say down to you know, the primary school level, I think. So, I mean, I think that's one way the cultural climate is shifting, you know, that these become you know, imperative types of literacy. You know, as far as the other side of it, one is actually a locus. Of, so I ran a workshop between the National Science Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. We're bringing together uh, program officers and you know, deans of universities, professors and others, you know, thought leaders in this area to think about, uh, about art science connections. Yeah, and, you know, and, and myself, you know, my background is not just in computer science, also at undergrad. I was a double degree in art as well as in, in computing, that's logic and computation. And, and so, you know, that's, you know, so that's just say getting the grounding, both BFA and BS, and I think really having commitment to each side and seeing each is equally important. Actually, my home college as an undergrad was a college of fine arts, you know, so, you know, so this just means that I took each of them as seriously and, and with equal credibility. You know, so, uh, you know, but I think even you know, thinking about it as one area that's a kind of a major or minor, even if not technically you know, through a degree, but just thinking about yourself that way, that you don't have to be restricted to one side or the other. You know, but you know, uh, one of the things that came out of this workshop was actually a great locus of, of innovation was in do-it-yourself communities, youth communities. You know, these are communities that are really in, uh, innovating the ways to use social media, you know, to mod games and, and, and so forth. And so you know, much like uh, people in, uh, you know, say, uh, communities where you know, improvisational African American music like jazz is being practiced was practiced in you know, you know, the 30s, 40s, 50s, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, you could you know, you know, say you know, play the saxophone in a new way that was formerly considered uh, you know, uh, incorrect, you know, and so forth, and innovate. I, th I think the same way. You know, these kind of communities are actually a locus of innovation. So it's not always. You know, that actually actually means that you know, I need to learn from these communities, and, and you know, maybe I have something to give. You know, and, you know, too. Also, there are different ways to interact socially. It means creating AAA game titles. That's like being a Hollywood film producer, even in terms of budgets of these games, right? And so, of course, there are constraints if you're going to make a Hollywood film you know, that you, know, you can go against you know, the mold to some degree, but you're operating within that kind of ecology. But now there, you know, that indie games distributed through downloadable content, that's almost like Sundance Film Festival or like, you know, Art House Film, right? It's sort of vetted by the industry. It has a market, you know, yeah, but, you know, uh, but, but they're a little bit lower cost and, and, and so forth. That's another venue. And then just creating systems on, on your own uh, as well. You know, these can be you know, grassroots efforts. You know, those can be effective uh, as well. And so it also depends on what kind of way, which ways you want to, uh, to innovate. And of course, people can navigate between each of, the, each of those different kind of categories you know, sometimes too. But, but you do mention you know, there is a kind of social, uh, socially and uh, economically driven power hierarchy you know, when you go into that realm of AAA titles you know, that, that, you know, that the same as participating in any mainstream industry with large revenue and, and, and interacting with multinational uh, corporations then uh, of course then, then there's kind of you need strategies for resistance and struggle and, or strategies to change from within, right? So, you know, so that, that's not limited just to this, this medium, but that's a kind of general issue in politics or resistance regar regardless of medium. Uh, okay, yes, and, 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 and uh, you, you can let me know when, when we're out of time. Until then, I'm just gonna keep going. Uh, uh, yes? When, when um, you look at synergies that, that games map from more real-life scenarios, like for example, like a sports game, uh, the Mexican football team is going to beat the Canadian football team, or the Canadian hockey team is going to beat the Mexican hockey team, as far as stats are In what ways does fantasy games, or even games that talk about the darkness of our reality, do they have a, a more responsibility to eliminate synergies with identity, or do games have a way of mapping real life in a realistic way, and where is it balanced? Do they have do they have to be better than us? Right. Well, uh, I'll, 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 I'll answer this way. You know, so I, I don't see myself as, as someone you know, that you know, I'm trying to police different people's form of, of artistic expression you know, in the sense that you know, I'll say that 
there is an innate responsibility to a certain set of constraints for representations within, within a medium. I think, as I mentioned, that you can present very negative representations in order to serve social good. You can have you know, you know, some representations that are empowering in games that actually fail as an experience and just seem like diversity training tools, right? So, right, you know, and, and so, yeah, first I would say, you know, what, do, what does it mean in general to make good you know, art or good cultural production regardless of, of, you know, uh, of that's the type of uh, medium? Right. And, and of course, there are a number of different criteria, criteria for that. Yeah, so I think your question lies within that, that realm. Yeah, so, what, you know, so I could answer personally, uh, I think that you know, having work that can construct uh, you know, the world building and identity building in, in a way that creates a very coherent ki kind of social, uh, 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 co coherent kind of thematic message and content, you know, there, you know, for me, uh, uh, and, you know, the nuance of the world building uh, can add up to emergent themes, right, so multiple playthroughs, those themes aren't just independent, you know, but, you know, part of my taste is where when you play through in different ways, those differences actually reveal something, like the film Rashomon, right, that tells the same story from different points of view, you know, so this is a story, actually, of a brutal crime a rape and a murder that takes place, uh, the classic Kurosawa film that's based on, on a short story. Uh, but it tells it from different points of view uh, of the perpetrator, of uh, the victim, and so forth. But they don't add up. You know, they all contradict each other. And so you end up, there's an emergent message. Like, where is truth in all of this? Right? And so for me, systems where you can play, th replayable systems like games, if you can do that and have meaningful difference where there's an emergent message, to me, that, that's what's uh, important. And this relates to an answer to the previous question about you know, just a, a writer who's a good writer, maybe it's not based on social science or any of this. One part of the book is focused on subjective computing, the idea that you can use these algorithms and data structures to express your own subjectivity you know, as, as an author. I want to also have a way that you can respect the authorial voice at the same time as using these, ki these kind of platforms. Because uh, as I mentioned, I have a kind of humility about the role of, of computing within this, uh, this realm. I don't think that doing a very precise or mathematical representation is better than doing the kind of representation like a, a novelist would come up with. You know, each has its uh, advantages. And so one question is to say, can you use this medium to do something more like uh, a very insightful novelist would? You know, you know, and, and if you think about the kind of writers I mentioned, you know, Ellison, for example, has a very unique point of view about racial invisibility. He built into, you know, he wrote into Invisible Man. And you know, I want to just think, how can you carry these insights into world building and character building and constructing agency and so forth into these systems? And that's what I think of as, uh, as subjective computing. And, and the difference is just you have, it's, it's like almost, uh, uh, a kind of paradox. You have to take these very nuanced, subjective uh, ideas and then regularize them within data structures and algorithms. And so then you need ways to think about how that process can take place. N and so what I think uh, is best is when people engage that reflectively, you know, think about that process, you have an orientation towards empowering users to be critically aware, and, and there's multiple playthroughs, help people to think and, and come to their own conclusions rather than spelling it out for people. You know, and you know, rather than saying any particular politics, you know, if a game has, if, or a system fulfills that kind of, those criteria, then that's when I would consider it to be successful. Wow, you've given us a lot to think about. I want to tell everyone that you can, in fact, catch up with the conversation on Twitter at Five College DH. I want to thank Amherst Media for recording this. It'll be available on our website also, fivecollegedh.org. So you can always go back and sort of digest some of the stuff we've been given. Please join me in thanking Professor Harold for joining us. Today.